joining. Uh, we're here to discuss data scientists, data science next act. How will engineering technologies affect roles, skills, applications, and industries? We have a fantastic panel here of experienced data scientists and uh, folks that have been managing data scientists for quite a lot, uh, many years. My name is Alan Terletto. I'm the field CTO at Redis. If you're not familiar with Redis, uh, we do have a booth at the front of the uh, conference. You can also check out uh, at 150, we have a session about LLMs and caching, better together. So I hope you guys do check that out. But let me start with introducing our um, panel here. So to my left, I have Rafia Javed. She's a machine learning engineer at Google. I'm also with Chris Yasko. He's a SVP and chief data scientist at Equifax. And we have Warren Herness, vice president, head of data science at Best Buy, so a great diverse group here with a lot of experience. I'm excited to hear what they have to say. I do have to add this disclaimer, so I'm just gonna go ahead and read it so I don't screw it up. All the panelists' commentary do not reflect the views or opinions of their respective organizations. All these folks are dedicating their time and their experience to share that with you here today for their own personal, um, for their own personal reasons. So let's begin by introducing our panel. So, Rafia, would you? Sure. Give us the honors. Yeah, hey everyone. Uh, so I'm currently at Google on an auction modeling team. So uh, working on online advertising auctions and uh, predicting terms within that. Um, prior to that, my data science career actually started at uh, MailChimp where I worked on using machine learning to s solve advertising problems for small businesses. So predicting customer lifetime value, um, helping them understand how to advertise effectively. Um, and I briefly worked at a healthcare AI startup as well, so applying machine learning to, to problems in the healthcare space. Thanks. All right, awesome. Christopher? Yeah, my name's Chris Yasko, and I have the best job at Equifax because I get to run what's known as the data science lab that I helped create about seven years ago. And it's a bunch of researchers trying to do new things with machine learning and algorithms, obviously. Explainable AI came out of the lab. We've got some fundamental patents on that. I've also got responsibility for going first. And we're a big Google partner. So when we talk about the Google Cloud, we talk about Vertex AI, I get to go first and try to make it work. And then a third part of the job is to teach everybody else. Equifax has 14,000 people, but 1,000 of them are data scientists or data engineers or analysts. So part of my job is what's called DNA University and we create bespoke classes and lectures to help train everybody in the company how to use our infrastructure and our technology. All right, that's fantastic. Warren? Hi, I'm Warren Hearns. I am VP and Head of Data Science for Best Buy. A common theme for me, and I think for Chris, as we've talked to earlier, is I love math, and I love using math to solve problems. I started my career in the military uh, I majored in math at the United States Military Academy, and I served for several years as an artillery officer in the Army. Once I left active duty, I came to Atlanta to uh, pursue my PhD in industrial engineering at Georgia Tech, and that was back in 1992. Uh, our research back then was in a machine learning area. It was reinforcement learning for robotic control. And I fell in love with Atlanta. I knew I wanted to live here. I also got married to a girl from here. So I have worked at a number of Atlanta companies. Um, I did optimization of job scheduling and inventory at uh, Lucent Technologies, the fiber optic uh, factory up on in Norcross. I spent eight years at UPS doing pricing optimization, fraud detection, and other machine learning projects. I spent a year at the Home Depot setting up a marketing sciences team for direct mail and email. And then almost a decade at a startup that we eventually took public uh, called Cardlytics down at Pont City Market, uh, where we um, set up the analytics and data science capabilities for them. Now I get to be chief data scientist for Best Buy, where I lead a team of about 50 data scientists and we infuse AI, machine learning, and optimization, not only into our strategy, but also into our operations so that we can uh, have a significant impact and deliver value to our customers. Uh, last thing I'll say is I love Atlanta. I love the vibrant data science community that we've built up here, and I'm honored to be on this panel. That's, that's an amazing, you have an incredible background. Thank you for your service. 
uh, first and foremost. You know, one of the things that jumps out of me here, uh, you mentioned you have an industrial engineering background or uh, education, I believe, uh, mechanical engineering, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. My undergraduate was electrical engineering. Yeah. And you have a medical background. Yes, I also went to got my master's at Georgia Tech. Okay. So Rafia was not only has was a doctor, uh, but also got her master's uh, in machine learning uh, from Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech that's correct. So an incredibly diverse uh, background, all linking today to the field of data science. I'm sure all of you have your own unique stories. It's really amazing about this field, about how people find their way, and I'm, we're going to dig further into that. Uh, in addition to how it really crosses all these different industries, we have folks from retail and financial services, Google. We have Google the vendor, Google the customer. Um, so bringing all of these, you know, amazing experiences together. So Rufias, going back to you, in your previous role, you mentioned that you were with MailChimp. You were more of a traditional data science role that we are all familiar with. Can you speak to that experience, the types of things you did there, and then also what you do at Google and how Google sees the data science role differently? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I think. Um you know, one thing with the uh, terminology around like data science, uh, machine learning engineering, as far as like role descriptions go, it can be really uh, region dependent um, and company dependent. Um, so like my advice to any job seeker would be to, uh, you know, keep that in mind that these terms can be fluid and like to really re read the role description to understand like where it lies on that spectrum of like uh, working on machine learning models versus like, um, you know, doing all of the uh, online serving and training. Um, and so, um, I think you know uh, at, uh, at currently at Google, I'm on a team of machine learning software engineers. So uh, we own a lot of different areas, including you know building uh, deep learning models, modifying them, creating the data engineering pipelines that feed them, uh, and then also like serving them and monitoring them and dealing with all the problems that arise. And one of the reasons we're able to own like all of these different areas, which are each by themselves like uh, very vast. Um, is that we have research teams and infrastructure teams that support us, so they are able to go deep into problems uh, within these spaces and then surface the results to us. Um, and so we're on the applied ML side in that sense that we use their findings and then you know tie them all together. Um, I think that you know data science as a field when it first uh, arose, um, you know came from an academic space where a lot of the tools um, and the people that used them. Uh, we're using them in an academic environment. Um, but I think in the last decade, you see that uh, it, every part of that spectrum, all the way from like building models to putting them in production, is moving more towards the software engineering end of the spectrum a little bit. Um, so like my advice to like people that are starting out in this field would be to like, you know, keep that in mind. Um, I think it's always like a good um, uh, tool in your tool belt to sort of be able to pull out the, those skills when you need them. All right, that's, that's quite amazing. So at, at Google, correct me if I'm wrong, there's no actual job role in terms of a data scientist. Is that correct? How do they I, see it? I think there is. I mean, it's, it's a very large company, so I can't say anything for sure. Um, there, are, there are data science. I think the data scientists I work with work uh, more from a product analytics perspective. So they build the experimentation platform um, that we use when we're trying to A-B test our model. Um, and so they go really deep on that, like helping us know if the results of these models serving different uh, traffic of customers are actually like statistically significant. Um, but that might be different in other parts of the company. Yeah, yeah. yeah quite amazing. So, you know, wherever your kind of journey begins, whether you're a software engineer, whether you're a machine learning engineer, whether you're a true data scientist, it looks like you can always kind of find your way and make sure, you know, uh, understanding how the organization sees it, how they specialize. Uh, and of course, that could be different by, you know, through different companies. And now we're going to get over to Chris where Data scientists for sure exist. Uh, you've been managing them throughout your career. Um, so for the audience that is trying to break into this field, and you know, we, we heard it all throughout the conference, right? You guys are being bombarded with tons of information about all the emerging technologies of the day. Um, and you have to kind of figure out how to navigate that as a partition, partition, uh, practitioner, really trying to sharpen your skills. So Chris, um, what's more important today for a data scientist? Is it hardening of those hard skills about the emerging technologies, or is it more about the soft skills being able to articulate your data findings and how to influence the business itself? Oh boy, that's an or question. I don't think, I think it's an and is the answer. I, I think you need hard skills and soft skills, and let me try to explain that. I mean, hard skills are programming. I mean, they, the, flavor of the month is Python, right? If you're a data scientist, you gotta write in Python. It's just where it's going. 
But if you go back a couple years, it was Java. You go back a few more years, it was C++. So the language itself isn't the hard skill, but knowing how to write algorithms, knowing how to debug code, right? Those are the things that are important. Also understanding the performance at runtime. A lot of data scientists are kind of, it's a mystery on where it's running. It's running in the cloud, right? But how much CPU and memory is it using? How much does it cost to run is a big thing these days. And there's a whole field of FinOps, if you haven't heard of that. So the hard skills for me are just, you know, being able to be a great programmer right? and be able to learn new languages and learn new concepts. The soft skills, I think you hear a lot of people talk about storytelling. Um, storytelling is certainly required, it, but that's at the end of the project, right? When you're telling the client what you found and you're making the presentation. What I think is probably a more important soft skill that is under perhaps recognized is at the very beginning of the project, when you try to figure out what are you trying to do, right? Talking to the stakeholder or client, really hearing what they have to say, right? Listening is a soft skill but also hearing what they have not said, and then be able to ask questions and probe a little deeper, because there's nothing worse, and, and I've been there, nothing worse than showing up a couple of months later with a presentation and a solution, and you're so proud of what you've done, and two minutes into the meeting, you realize that they're looking at you like, what did you do, right? That's not the problem I wanted solved. So you gotta get it right up front. All right, that's some sage advice there. So. You know, if I was kind of, just to kind of wrap that up, there's the hard skills, there's all the things that we're hearing today at the conference, but at the end of the day, if you're not able to influence, if you're not able to deliver to your customers what they see value in, not particularly what you see value in, then ultimately you won't be able to influence change, and that's really at the heart of the job. So being able to actively listen, and that's something that seems simple, but it's actually a skill set that you have to acquire, and then being able to translate that back to a person to understand that you are connecting back to that value, will allow you to not only build the right model, but then also be able to actually kind of sell that or, or create that narrative so that way it can influence that change. So putting that all together is gonna to be critical in order for you to be successful end to end. Yeah, that's right. I mean, literally those soft skills and some people um, think it's all about the technology, right? But no, you've gotta be able to listen and you've gotta be able to have a conversation. Yeah, that's perfect. So there's that people aspect and you're gonna hear us kind of uh, double down on that going forward. And, and, and Chris, I imagine, that makes it extra hard, and actually going back to Rafia, what you were saying, how diverse your kind of skill set is, it must be really hard in terms of hiring, and we're gonna to continue to kind of double down on that as well. All right, so moving on to Warren, um, we talked about emerging technologies. Uh, do you think that, which of the ones that we're kinda of hearing across the conference, or maybe something that you've seen you know, across your time, which of the ones are gonna be most impactful to the roles of a data scientist, of data engineering, and how is it gonna change the required skill set of those roles going forward? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the easy answer is obviously the, the generative AI. Um, I think there's a couple, I think there's a couple of other things um, that are coming down the road, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about three, I'll kind of gloss over the first two. I think, I think two of them um, kind of go hand in hand that, uh, that we're, we're looking at. Um, well, first, the first one is quantum computing, getting things done so much faster. Uh, one other thing that we are looking at is the fully homomorphic encryption, being able to share private data and do machine learning models uh, with encrypted data. I think those are, th those are two areas that will be further down the road. Uh, one area that I would like to talk about is an area that enabled ChatGPT, and that is uh, reinforcement learning. So I think that's getting a lot more excitement and hype. Um, now that it took reinforcement learning with human feedback to help these pre-trained transformers uh, become something that had a step change in the way that they are, um, the, the, the way are giving out uh, answers. So I think, you know, reinforcement learning has been around for, as a, as a machine learning concept, since the early 60s. Marvin Minsky, in his uh, seminal paper, Steps Towards Artificial Intelligence, talked about um, pattern recognition and reinforcement learning and some other things. And we were doing this in the 90s with some robotic control. But I'll, I'll admit, I had no idea that reinforcement learning with human feedback could, could change a large language model. But I think it gets to what we as humans um, 
fully understand as, as a sequential decision-making process. I mean, we, we look at the, the state of the world around us, our environment. We try to figure out what action we should take. We have a mental model for that. And then we take that action. We might get some potentially delayed reinforcement that could be a punishment or a reward. Um, and then we update our mental model. Uh, that's something that, that we all fundamentally understand, but it's, it's something that is getting, getting that update and getting, um, getting those things into something that we can uh, create value from in a realistic way. I think that's, that's the area. Yeah, I think that's incredible. And just, I guess you could see just from the conference, from all your comments, you know, the, the future is very bright for this role, for this field. Uh, it's pretty exciting to see what's coming on. So, Rafia, back to you. Um, at MailChimp, you actually leverage Burr models and Hugging Face. This was way before it was cool, before everybody knew the name, before we all read about it on LinkedIn, all right, for those of us that are not in the field. So, can you tell us about your experience with LLMs, um, some lessons learned about using them in production, and, you know, any kind of guardrails or risks that should be considered when using them at massive scale, certainly at, at Google scale. Talk to us about that. Yeah, definitely. And a couple of my coworkers who also worked on that are in the audience. So yeah, those were some good times. And um, yeah, at the time, you know, we used um, BERT-based embeddings to, we realized we could use them to classify um, the types of campaigns that our customers were uploading. Um, and it was in a batch, like offline setting, right? So um, it, it was a good setting to sort of utilize these very heavyweight models. Um, I think, you know, currently in, in the problems I work on, which are like online, real time, like feed and ad ranking, it can be difficult, to, even if you have like a very rich representation of some kind of input, um, it's not necessarily like worth the trade offs to sort of use all of those, right? Um, because you're trying to make uh, predictions with such low latency and like such high scale requirements. Um, so I think like, you know, being thoughtful about what those trade-offs are um, and whether you know, a simpler feature might actually like, be working just as well for you um, is something that I run into a lot. Um, just because we have a rich representation available doesn't necessarily mean that it's like, useful to us. Um, and what I do see is that, especially like now with the generative models, uh, one of the like, really uh, interesting skill sets is being able to recognize uh, these sort of creative opportunities to use them, um, which aren't obvious, like you have a hammer, but you can't actually throw it at everything. Um, but there's like, you know, sometimes like subtle areas where you might wanna generate headlines for your ads, or you might wanna do some sort of like zero shot classification task that really enriches your data set. Um, so I'm seeing more and more that like being able to recognize that is, is really important, yeah. Okay, amazing, so no one size fits all. There's nothing you're gonna hear at this conference that'll work for every single use case, for every single industry, right? For every single necessary scale. Can you speak to, uh, did you actually see that blog that was written? It's actually really interesting. You'd, uh, you could find it online about what would happen if Google turned on general AI uh, as part of its search. Can you speak to that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I know what you're talking about. I, I don't think, I, I don't know if I read it in detail, but yeah, exactly. Like, you know, um, just, Generating, for example, like a generated search result for, you know, just billions of queries um, and being able to utilize all the other contextual uh, information that might be part of that user's session, um, you know, we would start seeing search be incredibly slow um, and it would also be very, very expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't necessarily be more of what you needed uh, compared, to, compared to models that can utilize other uh, information about your history, other activity across other platforms. So, um, so yeah, definitely you always have to be like thoughtful about what the user actually wants. Like just because it's cool for you to watch it happen, you know, in real time or because it's interesting doesn't mean it like long term provides, provides the most user value. But, you know, sometimes it does too. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So I think the lesson there is uh, understand trade-offs and understand that just because there's a nice shiny object, you don't necessarily have to do it, right? Uh, always work backwards from your user, understanding of cost, understanding of the impacts across the business. So even at Google, uh, they have to kind of be wary about those things. So Christopher, at Equifax, you guys might not have Google level massive scale, uh, but you do have your own cost constraints. And by that, I mean regulators and regulations. So as within that context, can you give us your perspective on the opportunities for generative AI within the financial services field, but also the risks that need to be considered when it comes to regulations? Uh, sure, opportunities and risks for generative AI. The 
Yeah, it's true. I mean, if you're in the banking and lending business, it's regulated. The CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Board, oversees you as part, as part of the U.S. government. In Europe, Australia, Canada, other places have their own parliaments and regions. The um, same is true if you were in the medical field for healthcare, right? stuff like that. The interesting part about generative AI is uh, well, maybe twofold when you think about the risks and we'll talk about opportunities. The people worry about data leakage, right? putting information into the cloud, into the space, putting things in a prompt. Okay, I get that. You, you can probably train people, stop people, you know, monitor that so that it doesn't happen. But it's the opposite direction that worries me. What happens when you ask you know, uh, some type of generative AI to write you some code, or, and it brings down something that works really well and you put it in your product? You don't know where that came from. You don't know how it got there. You don't know if it was originally part of the training and it was open source, or if somebody screwed up and put proprietary code or you know, patented information or copyrighted up, in, up into the space that you're using. So I'm more concerned with generative AI um, for pulling things down that we don't own and putting it in products than I am the other direction. That's probably the, the biggest risk um, for, for what I see. The, the regulated risk is this time, I don't, they, they don't know what to do, right? I mean, literally, they don't know what to do. Uh, they're gonna need help to try to explain what's possible. They're gonna need help to suggest how do we attribute some of the decisions that we're making. So over the last few years with AI, it was explainable AI. You'd heard of the back, excuse me, the black box problem where you couldn't see into a neural network or couldn't see into a gradient boosted machine. To try to figure out the path that it went through so that you could explain the decision that was made. So in financial services, the decision might be, do I get the mortgage, yes or no? And if it's no, why? Right? Um, if you're in healthcare, it's certainly a lot more significant, right? Do you, do you have a diagnosis, uh, yes or no, and, and then why? So very interesting on where this is gonna go. I'm not sure where the regulators are gonna lead this and how much oversight. But the opportunities for generative AI I, in our company, and probably most companies, the, there's a, things that make sense and things that are a little strange. If anyone saw Bill Franks, he did a terrific job here yesterday in one of the breakout sessions on generative AI. If you haven't, didn't see him live, check out the video. Uh, he takes us through some examples, which I don't want to steal from him, but I think they're terrific. Uh, generative AI was used for some things made for it, uh, and other things not. So if we're gonna do creative things, like write a story, write a poem, something like that, well, that's what, that's what it's made to do. So if you're gonna write a letter, right, maybe from a customer call center, terrific. If you're gonna write some code, well, that's creative, right? That's generative. It's a very much a time saver. It's a productivity enhancement. So I see that that's where it should be used and will be used, and we're looking at that today in operations and call centers and marketing and those types of things. Where I, where I think it doesn't fit is when you try to ask it questions and to give you um, something significant that it has not been trained on. And that's the key. It hasn't been trained on, for example, Equifax data. So if I, ask it a, if I dump in a bunch of our data profiles and I ask it a question about that, I'm not really sure what I'm gonna get for an answer. Um, so to take those types of LLMs and those technologies and put them into products at this point, you know, we're, we're apprehensive of that. Yeah, that, that's an amazing. I love the way you kind of wrap that together with the opportunities and the risks. Of course, like any innovation, regulations are trailing. Uh, you know, on that last end, uh, we actually did a session to, to kind of cover that use case of, well, how do we actually ground the LLM? How do we kind of avoid those hallucinations? So if you haven't heard throughout the conference, some of the talks around RAG kind of concepts or retrieval augmented generations, definitely check that out. Again, we have that session at 150 where we'll cover that as well. So I think that can touch on how you can kind of mix in that proprietary data, ground that LLM, and try to avoid some of the things uh, that Christopher was talking about. But uh, kicking it over to Warren. So Warren, kind of similar to what I asked Chris in terms of opportunities and risks. You're in retail. Um, what are the opportunities? And it feels like retail really can benefit from generative AI across a myriad of use cases. So what are the types of opportunities that you're seeing but also from a risk perspective, 
in terms of all the data you guys are aggregating, what are the societal and ethical concerns that you guys are considering as you, as you kind of venture forward? Well, as, as Chris said, we've, we've got a lot of the standard opportunities, whether it's in uh, call center help, uh, virtual assistant, uh, things that are helping either the employees or consumers. And the risks are brand and reputational risks. Uh, people come to Best Buy for great, accurate information about some of the technology that they're buying. And if we can create some systems, either using RAG or <coughs> using something, some new type of technology that can possibly triage some of those questions uh, where um, it's not unlike what's going to happen to data scientists and others as we use some of these things. We think we can, we can automate some of those, um, those lower level tasks so that we can spend time on these higher level tasks to make our customers happy. Um, so I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be more tested out in a human in the loop type of, um, type of system where a, an employee will see something and it's going to give them some information and then they give it back to the customer just so that we can, we can feel more comfortable that, that the answers are correct. But you know, it could be, and this is not, I'm not saying this is for Best Buy, but it could be an analogy of like uh, you know, Google Maps or the GPS in your car. Every single one of us trusts that implicitly. And we've all found, or at least I have, if I'm driving in Atlanta and I think I have a better way to get there than Google Maps does, I'm 99% of the wrong, 99% uh, of the time, I regret not following that decision. So I think at some point in the future, some of those algorithms and technologies, we will ha have built enough trust in to where we implicitly uh, just understand it. And maybe it's going to be uh, summarizing uh, search results, or maybe it's going to be summarizing survey results or customer feedback or some of those other things. But it's going to be, you know, it has to be something that is, that we work our way into. So I think those are the opportunities weighed in with some of the risks. I think from basically internally, it's going to be how can we leverage what we already have? If we already have a vector database, how can we add a large language model and do that in the most efficient manner. How do we learn which model itself, uh, based on the cost and in what's being returned? Um, how do we use? How do we figure out what's the cost and, and at what level do we use either open source or commercial models? All right, that's fantastic. You know, something that struck a chord with me was about the confidence level that we put towards technology. And when we think about that, it's, a lot of times what I see is. Uh, right now, everyone's kind of just testing the waters, maybe using generative AI as kind of an internal tool so we can still add that human context because we don't really have that confidence to expose it out to our end customers. But you brought up the example of Google Maps and that kind of struck a chord with me because I just recently, uh, on a personal note, I uh, decided with my wife um, to, we were going to take a trip to Iceland. It was going to be an adventure. Um, I kind of, you know, did two days of research. We rented a car. We went down there and we, and we just went off. And she said, how are we going to know how to get to places? And if you've ever been to Iceland, not all the roads are paved, and there's not even a road to everything. And we drove around the whole island. And basically what I did was I put my life and my life in the hands of Google Maps. Because believe it or not, they have an incredible internet, much better than I have in my home. And I was able to navigate across this island in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it was an incredible journey. And I just trusted the technology and it really kind of made the difference. So speaking about the confidence level there, I do want to follow up on one, one thing because I'm a bit of a do-it-yourselfer. And I saw this commercial, I believe it came out of Home Depot. You said you have a background with Home Depot. And it was, they were taking a picture of a tool and right away it told them what the tool was and where you could find it in the store. And as a do-it-yourselfer, if any of you are like that and you need a screw, you know it could take you 20 minutes to go find that screw in Home Depot, right? So having that technology to be able to recognize something pretty quickly, and I think that can translate into Best Buy and some of those use cases. So from an external user perspective, do you see use cases like that in retail as well? Sure. I, I think for um, using computer vision uh, and using image search uh, to find out what we, where we need to restock things in, in, the, uh, in the store, to find it. I mean, we already have a way that you can technically find something, 
it's just with a little light. Uh, and, and few people know about, go to the app, turn on the light, and it'll tell you where to go in the store. Now, a, an image search would be, would be uh, a much more, I guess, intuitive and, and user-friendly. Now, I, I also think that you'll be able to do things in data science. One area that I, that I did early in my career was mathematical optimization, because machine learning hadn't really caught on in the 90s when I took my first role. But I also think that optimization is an area that we don't use enough in, in some of the companies that I've been in. And part of that is, you, as a data scientist, you're trained on these, uh, these models that start with data and, and infer the model from it. And you're not necessarily trained on mathematical modeling and building constraints and building objectives. I'm, I'm thinking that it, will be, it won't be too far in the future that we will just say, have a domain expert tell you what the, tell the system through a large language model, the constraint on this, uh, this distribution center is we have 20 doors and we have these hours of operations and we have this many people and it will start to write these models and we will see a, a lot more of the more traditional industrial engineering with, um, with some of these large language models. So incredible opportunities there. Thank you for that. So I do want to change gears a bit. I want to get it back to kind of the people aspect. I know as a conference, I spoke to a lot of uh, interns yesterday, a lot of the kind of young folks trying to break into this field. So I do want to kind of start there. And, and, and Rafia, you have such an incredible kind of background and story. You, right, we started in the medical profession. You ended up going to Georgia Tech. You got that machine learning uh, master's degree. So can you tell us about your journey, how you got from being a doctor back into you know, machine learning and eventually ended up at Google? Yeah, certainly, yeah. So um, I, um, uh, during my MD, I actually worked in a neuroscience lab where we were uh, doing machine learning on neurophysiological signals and so sort of the original neural network um, and studying like how that worked in the auditory cortex. Um, and I just thought it was very cool. Like at the time I wanted to um, become a neurologist um, and I started, that was sort of my first intro to how powerful machine learning was in, you know, recognizing patterns and data, which is um, a lot of what you're trying to do as a, as a physician, right? Um, along with the people aspect, along with the human aspect. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, I, 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 I'm still very interested in sort of like how ML is applied to healthcare. Um, but um, I realized that, you know, I would be a lot happier as a machine learning uh, engineer than I would as a physician. Um, and so uh, one of the first things I did was, like, I started um, a startup sort of in the healthcare informatics um, space trying to use, um, you know, computation and, and just the internet actually to make um, healthcare problems uh, to solve specifically, like, how um, we find uh, healthcare resources in places where, that, where they're difficult to find. Um, and then, you know, I did this incubator out of Georgia Tech and started my master's there and then uh, found myself very happy as a data scientist uh, a couple years after that. So, yeah, the transition has been uh, what, what was really interesting. Um, I think I'm definitely much happier working in software than I was as a physician. But I also think, I still think a lot about how, uh, you know, on topics like how generative models might be used in healthcare. I find myself like still very much thinking as a physician in that sense where I have a lot of qualms about that. Um, but I also like uh, get very excited about ways in which um, machine learning has made uh, healthcare a lot better, um, uh, especially like uh, interesting things you see in drug discovery or genetics. Um, I think it's very cool to, to see how um, just this new field can completely revolutionize uh, what seems like kind of like a, a very different field. Yeah. All right, that's an incredible journey. So, you know, in, in prep, uh, Rafia and I kind of had, we made a couple jokes about, for those of you that are you know, into memes, uh, you ever see the one where, you know, the guy's walking and he has his hand around his girlfriend, but he's always kind of looking back, and that's kind of Rafia looking back at machine learning, you know, as she's becoming a doctor. So it was, she always kind of felt that drawback, right, to getting, to getting back into the field. So, but it's amazing because you have this cross-domain expertise. So who knows, maybe we'll, uh, maybe some entrepreneurship is in your, you know, in your future, thinking about some of the use cases that are out there in the medical field that aren't yet addressed. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, well, looking to see great things out of you. Uh, Christopher, so, you know, one of the things about hype cycles, they're kind of a, almost kind of a negative connotation. But what they do do is bring a lot of attention, they bring a lot of momentum, specifically to fields like this that, 
you know, are really hard to, to hire around. So we, we, earlier we touched on hiring and what that means. So as a hiring manager for many years, can you share your experience on the challenges of hiring data scientists and how that's evolved over the past few years? Sure. I mean, data science as a career is hot. Right? So if you've got your chops uh, and you can prove it, you can work almost anywhere. So it is very difficult to bring people in. And talk maybe a little bit mid-career and then early career. Uh, for me, I actually look for two things. And if you work with me, you've heard this many times. I, what I call the gift and the choice. And the gift is when you were born, it was a gift from your parents, it's your intelligence. So we try to test your intelligence, right? Can you solve problems? Can you, do you know the mathematics? Those types of things. The choice is your attitude, your attitude when you come to work every day. And I'm actually old school. I'll get several references, many references, and I will personally call them and talk to try to find out how, how do you work? How do you work with others? How do you work under stress? Those types of things. And when I bring a mid-career person in, people kind of get a kick out of it. I'll invite you to Atlanta for a couple of days. You know, come with us for a day of interviewing, and I make sure you talk to many people. Right? Five, six, seven people would not be uncommon. We'll test you on your skills. We'll also get a little bit about your background, uh, but make sure you fit in the group. Right? Because you're making a choice to come work for us. Right? You're choosing usually to quit your current job and then come work for us. So that's a big choice. So you got to make sure you fit in the community of people you work around. And then also you know, for relocation folks, spend a couple days. You know, hiring into Atlanta is easy uh, for those people who live here and have lived here a while, uh, especially in the springtime. Right? Bring them down for a day or two. Uh, have them look at housing, have them look at the community, because you're making a choice. Again, you're making a choice to come relocate and move to a different city. And I want you to stay here, and I want you to be happy, right, both where you live and, and who you work with. I think that that's a big part of it. Uh, for out of college folks, and I did meet some college students here uh, in the last day or two, um, you've got a lot of opportunity, and I think the, the hiring for those folks is difficult especially when you're coming from the top universities, you know, including the ones here in Atlanta. And would you believe, you know, I try to hedge my bets, right? I try to get into the colleges before you graduate. So I've got a network of faculty and professors, but partially I make that personal commitment as well as the commitment of my company. So we've opened up a financial services innovation lab at Georgia Tech. We've got two labs at Kennesaw State. One is an ethical AI lab. Actually, in my research group, I've got professors uh, from Tech and KSU, but also from the University of Georgia, the University of North Carolina, uh, and we're looking at one other, who are employees of the company and are allowed to use our data and allowed to use our platform to do their research and then publish. And I use them sort of as my eyes and ears to look for the best students right, and have them come work for us. Because when you get down to it, it it's, it's not all about you know, the, the brand name of the company or the technology that you're using. Certainly those are important, especially when you're graduating and looking for your first job. But it's really the connections, right? You wanna get referrals, you wanna get people to get to know you right, before you graduate, because you wanna be successful. Right? You wanna be successful in your first job. And, uh, and I don't expect people to come to work for me and work 35 years. Uh, but at least they should have a couple of good years right, as they get started. All right, I think there's just so many amazing tidbits there. You could probably do a master's class on hiring, I believe. Um, but if I was to kind of summarize this, so first of all, it's a hot field, it's very competitive. And you know, Christopher not only uh, takes this very seriously and clearly puts his time and effort into things, um, has recruiters and a lead list. Um, he might even be giving envelopes to these professors underneath the hood. I don't know what's going on there. Um, but he's thinking about it as a bilateral, long-term relationship, right? And when I say bilateral, it means it's not just what's in it for the company, but what's in it for you, right? It's spending the couple days, getting to know the team, understanding the role, and understanding that not only are you the fit for the role, but are you gonna be happy in that role? Because ultimately, that'll make sure that you have that long-lasting relationship within the community, within that organization. And it's amazing to see a hiring manager put that much thought and effort, frankly, uh, into something like this, because I think if I was to, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, 
you feel like people at the heart of it is the most important part oh God, of the formula. Yeah, yeah, I get very low turnover in my groups uh, because we spend so much time up front, quite frankly. It's, it's amazing, very commendable. <coughs> All right, Warren, so what advice you know, do you wish you were given when you were first starting out after everything that you've seen? And how do you think that advice may have changed now with all the emerging technologies and kind of the evolution of this role? That's a, good, that's a great question. Um, two things. One is, and maybe it's different now because data science um, is fairly well established, but don't even think data science was a term until like 2008 or 2009. And I started my career in the 90s. <clears throat> so part of this goes into the communication and the soft skills and the storytelling. In some of my first roles, I thought that the math would tell the story. Uh, so I had to learn pretty early on that a lot of the executives didn't understand the math and they needed, and, and they needed some coaching on exactly what optimization or some machine learning was doing for them. So, so that is one piece of advice I wish I'd had a little earlier. I guess the other advice is, is basically, as data scientists, we know uh, there's an explore versus exploit trade-off in our algorithms, in reinforcement learning, in, in that you can set some parameters. How much do you want to try the new stuff? And how much do you want to exploit what you've already learned? Um, and so this goes for people in their careers. It goes for what you want to learn. It goes for businesses trying to do new things. But the, the advice is try to figure out how much time you're going to explore the new things. And, but also you've got to take that foundation and exploit what you already know to either get a paycheck or serve your customers and that is something that keeps you, because we know everything's changing. If all you do is exploit what you already know, you're going to stagnate and you're going you're gonna to fall out of the market. So you've got to explore some new things. So try that. Know that you can, uh, from a reinforcement learning paradigm, you can fail a lot and still succeed. And you will, you will have a chance if you get into a role that is not exactly for you. Give it six months or a year, put two or three bullet points on your LinkedIn profile from that and get that next job. Try to get, try to get a job with Chris over there and you'll, you'll be there 35 years. So that's what I would say is um, not every decision is, is the final decision. This is a sequential process throughout your life. You're always learning something. And um, so that's, that's the advice. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's amazing advice. And I would just say that you guys are already on that road, right? If there's anyone that has kind of a pasta syndrome right now or thinking like, I don't know where to start. You all showed up. You're all at this conference. You're all learning something new, right? I hope you go into a session about something maybe you haven't heard about in the past. And if you really want to take advantage of the situation, you'll come find Warren, right? You'll come find Rafael, you'll come find Chris, and you'll begin to establish that network you begin to learn and take the next step and think about what that could look like. So I commend everyone for being out here, for learning, and of course uh, with this fantastic panel, being able to learn from them. So on the, just, I'm just gonna go around here on the last lap uh, just to take something actionable. I think it's a good way to kind of end this panel. So something that for every uh, person here that you guys can actually take home and maybe do something with that. So Rafia, what's something actionable that you think our audience can take away from this discussion or beyond? Uh, yeah, so um, I think, um, yeah, touching on, on some of the stuff that we covered, like, uh, I think find out uh, with new technologies, like, where you see people applying them, like, really effectively, um, and sort of build that muscle for recognizing uh, problems that, uh, that are, like, uh, low-hanging fruit for the particular, uh, you know, skill set that you want to use. Um, and I think for some of the people earlier in their careers or just starting out in the audience, I think like, um, yeah, one actionable thing from our discussion earlier about like data science versus machine learning engineering um, is to like look at where the field is going and, and to prepare yourself for that change. So, you know, whether you're in a data science program right now and you see opportunities for learning a little bit more about like ML infrastructure or ML ops or data engineering, like definitely take those. I think it's always 
um, easier to become hireable once you can show that um, you're willing to sort of cross that bridge uh, into, into the teams that you'll be working with. All right, all right, that's great advice. So keep looking ahead, get your hands dirty, and uh, continue to move forward. Christopher? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so as you leave here, I'm gonna share the advice I got from my mentor, and then I'll talk about mentor in a minute. The advice I got was never eat lunch alone. And that's a terrific advice because it is talking to people and learning about what other people are doing in the industry, right? Certainly learning skills and projects at the company cafeteria, but also whether it's conferences or you know down, down the road somewhere, uh, getting to know people, right? Building up your network, getting to understand what's possible outside you know, your current job and what's going on. Absolutely terrific advice. Don't run back to your cubicle or your office and eat for 10 minutes and keep working. It's an absolutely terrific advice. And the mentorship, throughout my 30 plus years that I've been working at various companies, I've always seeked out a mentor. I've went and found one, and, and it's a formal relationship. I ask somebody, will you want to be my mentor? It's somebody that I've selected. And I've, I've got one now who is actually a, a CFO at a, at a billion dollar company. Because I don't know a lot about finance. And he doesn't know much about data science. So it's you know give and take where I can help him on some of the things he's doing. And he can certainly help me with my questions and, and kind of my concerns at, at the place I'm at my role now is you know, how do you invest in data science and labs and things like that? What are, what are the things that the C-suite is looking for for a, a business case? So find somebody who you can really talk to and uh, they will help you. And it's usually for several years, right? It's not permanent. It, you, you go through time and for different reasons, different mentors. Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic advice. The only thing I would add from my own experience is ask the question. You know, it's so often that we are nervous that the person's going to say no. Oh, they must be so busy. They're in a, you know, they have such a big job. There, there's no way they would mentor me. Ask the question. I think you'll be surprised if you haven't been through this already. How uh, much people want to give back? How much people want to share information and are willing to mentor you? So ask the question. Reach out. Build that network. You'd be surprised. I think how many people are willing to help you. Or yeah, I'll I'll be quick since. Um Networking is super important, but what I would say is most of us, at least, at least me, most of us are introverts. We don't like to go up to somebody that we don't know and talk to them. But at some things that I do at conferences is I make it a point to, to meet at least two, two new people each time I'm there. And sometimes it's in the lunch line or something like that. And talk to them about what they're doing. It's not all about you telling them what you're doing. Talk to them about what they're doing. So, you know, just, just identify a couple of people. Maybe they're standing around. Maybe they're more introverted than you. So go up and, um, and approach them in a very nice, cautious way and, and ask some questions. There you go. Sounds like we're uh, dating again in high school, right? Exactly. <laughs> and remember, any good date, you listen more than you talk, right? All right, guys, we're, we're at the end here. This, I think this was a fantastic panel. I hope you guys got a lot of value for it. The folks here, they're going to be in the conference, so you might catch up with them. So on behalf of Data Science Connect, on behalf of Redis, and on behalf of our panelists, thank you so much for taking your time and sharing all of your knowledge. Thank you all for attending.